Today we're going to be talking about um, the struggle for liberation by Black New Yorkers between the end of World War II, 1945, and 1970. Um, this is a story that uh, starts off with a lot of hope, um, but uh, a lot of these new people who are, are seeking uh, liberation from Southern terrorism that we've discussed in earlier episodes uh, are, are met with some real difficulties when they get to New York. They find a city that is pretty limiting in terms of Black opportunities uh, with regards to housing, with regards to employment, uh, and with regards to education. So the question becomes, what do we do about this? How do we organize against these conditions? Um, and there are many paths in the struggle for Black liberation, um, and we're going to explore those today. after World War II, uh, the beginning of sort of what, what history is called the Second Great Migration. Um, you know, a lot of African Americans, they go to fight Nazis and white supremacy and, and they come back and things have not changed all that much. I mean, things were beginning to change, right? You, you did have integration in the military. You did have integration in baseball in 1947. Um, integration at, at some level, How, however, on a mass scale, um, white supremacy and white supremacist structures uh, remain in the United States, particularly in the U.S. South. And so what you have during this period, 1940 to 1970s, um, you, you see a massive wave of African Americans moving from South to North. It's actually a larger wave than the initial Great Migration. Uh, about half a million Black Southerners came to New York State between 1940 and 1960. The vast majority of them ended up in New York City. Uh, just in the first 10 years of that period, 1940 to 1950, uh, there were 266 hundred thousand newcomers um, of African American descent coming to New York State. About 211 thousand of them um, settled in New York City. By the early 1940s, there were about 485,000 Black New Yorkers. 300,000 of them lived in Harlem. So Harlem is this center. Uh, the influx of newcomers resulted in a lot of shortages, though, right? You have all of these people coming into a single neighborhood. Um, it, it's going to create some shortages, and those shortages ended up being primarily in housing, where families were kind of stacked on top of each other in the same way that uh, happened with immigrant groups earlier. Um, families would double up uh, in, in apartments. Um, they would often have to share bathrooms with strangers and kitchens with strangers. Um, there was an overcrowding, a lack of enforcement of housing and sanitation codes, which resulted in very unsanitary conditions. Uh, landlords took advantage of this um, crisis, uh, this overcrowded crisis by raising rents. And, and you know, further, as the population is growing, you have more and more people looking for work. This allows employers to, to say, I'm only going to pay you this much because I go and hire the next guy from North Carolina, um, much less because he'll take any job. Um, and, and so this hurts workers. And, and during the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, um, Harlem is beginning to become a slum. White folks, as well as Black middle class folks, seeking opportunities uh, to kind of live this new conception of the American dream with the house and the picket fence, leave who's left um, are, are people without a lot of capital and a lot of, without a lot of political power. And um, these people are exploited and uh, Harlem continues to deteriorate. Uh, there are still very severe limitations, even in the North um, for African-Americans in terms of housing options. Uh, there are new construction projects going on like uh, Stuyvesant Town, uh, which is built, um, as you guys know, just north of the Lower East Side. It has begun in the 1940s, and um, it is designated uh, segregated housing complex. And um, this really hurts African Americans. There's a lot of anger because uh, it, this was part of the arrangement made with the city. But this isn't the last time that sort of African American and, and Black and Brown communities throughout the city, as well as low income white communities. Um, immigrant communities largely are, are thrown under the bus uh, to make way for progress. Uh, and, and what largely that meant in New York City was tearing down black and brown communities and uh, poor immigrant communities from Europe. Um, right, this happens in the Bronx, this happens in Brooklyn. All in all, there are a number of communities that um, are either divided or destroyed. About half a million uh, people in predominantly Black, Latino, and uh, immigrant communities from South and Eastern Europe uh, were kicked out of their home. Uh, these communities are raised to the ground. The city says, don't worry, we got you. Um, we're going to build housing. And what 
they built was the projects and the projects um, they were segregated, uh, they were unsafe, and, and they were located in the most impoverished neighborhoods. Um, about one third of East Harlem, for instance, was taken out to, to make way for the Wagner, Taft, and Jefferson complexes. And, and what we're seeing here is just sort of a shifting of urban geography uh, to, to lower the living standards uh, of African Americans and Latinos to make way for wealthy people to, to both live and to profit um, off of new developments. There's another thing that's going on called redlining. And so redlining begins uh, with the New Deal, actually, and the Federal Housing Administration, uh, which has started um, during the New Deal. It guarantees loans to banks, saying that if it's giving money to a family so that they can buy a home and they fail to pay you back, we, the government, promise you that we will pay you back. That's not an issue, right? That sounds pretty good. So what it allows for is for uh, people who normally wouldn't have the financial wherewithal to, to buy a new home, they are allowed to, to go and buy a home. And, and you know, if they can't pay it back, that's okay. The government uh, pays back the banks, the bank feels comfortable. Um, a lot more people are able to afford new homes. Um, the only problem with this is the government created color coded maps for the banks saying, we will secure loans in all of these neighborhoods except for the ones that we've marked red. Now, how did they decide which neighborhoods were marked red? Uh, the largest driver of this was race. And so the red zones were, were mostly where black and brown folks lived. And so as a result, black and brown folks are unable to afford their own homes. Uh, they're unable to secure loans to build new homes. A and those neighborhoods um, end up becoming much poorer. Um, and, and the people within those neighborhoods um, become much poorer. And so this sort of starts a cycle of perpetual poverty. Um, this practice was made illegal in 1968 However, uh, banks continue to use these maps on deciding whom to give loans to and whom not to give loans to, and in what neighborhoods do we secure loans and in what neighborhoods don't we secure loans. And this impacts schools too, right? Schools are largely paid for in local property taxes. And so if uh, you don't have high property values because banks refuse to secure loans to build nice homes in your neighborhood, uh, that's gonna deeply impact the schools because the schools won't have as much money uh, to, to fund for teachers and to fund for new books and to fund uh, for clean classrooms. And so this further accelerates um, sort of the wealth gap between black and white. While housing discrimination is made officially illegal in New York City in 1957, it, it still happens in practice that African Americans are excluded from some neighborhoods. So while you do have some middle class African Americans moving out of Harlem and into suburbs, uh, for a lot of folks, the, the options were limited. So it wasn't just housing that limited Black opportunities, but it was also economic opportunities that, that were denied to African Americans in New York City. Uh, Blacks were denied access to many factory positions. When industrial jobs were available to African Americans, they were generally offered the lowest paying, the lowest skilled, um, the, the littlest room for advancement positions uh, that offered few, if any, benefits and, and limited the opportunity to climb the economic ladder. Uh, there were some, albeit limited, uh, opportunities for African-American women in New York City, but uh, generally this was as clerical staff. And, and sometimes they were only given this opportunity to, to make sure that white staff members wouldn't have to interact with black clientele. Um, so uh, racism was creating positions uh, for, for African-Americans so that white folks wouldn't have to ever interact with them. So what do you do if you're an African-American in the city? Um, well, a lot of African-Americans look to pretty radical ideologies and, and would become sympathetic with socialism or communism and, and ideologies that preached economic equality among all peoples, um, as opposed to capitalism, which, you know, wants to produce as much wealth as possible, uh, even if the vast majority of that wealth, as it exists both then and today, going to a few mostly white male elites. Um, Further, these lefties, uh, the communists and the socialists, they, they were the ones who were the best allies um, among the white population, often supporting civil rights and opportunities for economic advancement for African-Americans long before white liberals or white conservatives would. There was a problem. The United States was in a 
struggle with the Soviet Union, um, which was communist, uh, the United States was capitalist. And so anybody who was communist or identified with communism or was sympathetic with communism, uh, particularly in the early years of the Cold War, uh, was deemed an enemy of the state. Um, the Communist Control Act, uh, which was signed by Dwight Eisenhower in 1954, outlawed the Communist Party. I know some of you might be thinking, but what about freedom of speech? A lot of African Americans and a lot of uh, white communists as well uh, were persecuted under this law in the same way that the FBI targeted Garvey for pushing an economic strategy that would empower the black community. Uh, communists generally and black communists particularly found themselves targeted by the FBI and the US government. Many black New Yorkers found themselves on blacklists or if they immigrated to this country as black nationalist and communist party member Claudia Jones sent a year in prison for quote on American activities before being deported in 1955. She explains. It was here on this soil that I early experienced experiences which are shared by millions of native-born Negroes. The bitter indignity and humiliation of second-class citizenship. It was out of my Jim Crow experiences as a young Negro woman, experiences likewise born of working-class poverty, that led me to join the Young Communist League and to choose at the age of 18 the philosophy of my life the science of Marxist-Leninism. The black New York City councilman, uh, Benjamin Davis, was one of 11 communist leaders convicted um, in 1949 of conspiring to overthrow the government. Uh, and he would spend over three years in, in prison. Uh, we talked about Paul Robeson last episode. Uh, he was blacklisted and unable to work in this country and had his passport taken away from him. When he was summoned, uh, to a congressional committee about sort of why he would unrelentingly support communism and wouldn't support the United States as it engaged in wars with communist powers abroad, like in Korea and Vietnam. He was asked, you know, if he liked Russia so much, the, the supporter of communism worldwide, why didn't he just move there? Um, he explained, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country. And I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to have a part of it just like you, and no fascist mining people like you will drive me from it. Is that clear? The repression, however, it, it didn't stop groups from organizing creatively. Uh, ideas about group economics, which had been powerful for a long time, as we talked about with Philip A. Payton, reemerged in the 1940s in powerful ways. Uh, the Carver Federal Savings and Loan Association is the oldest continuously operating Black-owned bank in the country, and it was opened on West 125th Street in January 1949 to provide mortgages to local residents. Uh, the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement was founded by a Dominican-born person of African descent, uh, Carlos Cooks, um, before the Black Power Movement that we're going to talk about in a bit took off in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Cook organized a convention in 1959 which proposed that the word Negro be replaced by African and Black. He advocated patronize your own race, build a solvent foundation for your children, help create employment and independence for your race. He's coming from a long line of thinkers um, that, that believe that the way to strengthen the black community isn't just by integrating into white structures, uh, but to support black businesses, to, to empower African Americans, to empower your own community. There were mainstream civil rights leaders in New York, like we talked about, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and Congressman Clayton Powell Jr., who was discussed in the last episode. Um, integrationists uh, were, were seemingly pretty victorious in the late 1940s, um, integrating the military, integrating the arms industry, and in New York City, uh, well, in Brooklyn, uh, with the Dodgers, Jackie Robinson, um, arrived in the major leagues in 1947. In uh, 1954, you have Brown versus Board of Ed, which makes it illegal to segregate in educational settings um, in public schools. Um, in New York City, you had the Harlem Nine, uh, which in 1959, a, a group of nine Black mothers of children in Harlem uh, who were attending segregated, ill-equipped schools, um, that they struck and withheld their children from these schools. 
the women, the mothers were uh, prosecuted uh, for not sending their children to schools, but then a judge uh, said uh, it was an act of love, trying to improve the education opportunities for their children. Even though you have some of these victories, there are problems that emerge uh, when integration is taking hold and, and also sort of the slow pace of integration is also causing frustration in the black community. What segregation meant to some businesses in the black community was that they had a space to operate and make money uh, away from mainstream white society, that a place where w white folks wouldn't try to take over. If everything's integrated, uh, that, then white people are going to come in and dominate institutions that black people attend and that white people attend. Um, 38,000 black teachers and administrators in 21 southern and southern bordering states uh, would end up losing their jobs after Brown versus Board of Ed it integrated the schools because you have all of these schools that are coming together. Fewer schools mean fewer teachers. Um, it wasn't the white teachers that were getting fired. It was the black teachers, 38,000 black teachers and administrators. In, in baseball, you had the Negro Leagues, which was sort of coexisting alongside the major leagues, um, but uh, its own league, uh, it was not as well funded. Players did not make as much money. However, it existed in its own sphere and you had black managers and black coaches and some black ownership. You had black folks working in the concessions. Obviously you had black players. Um, after integration, while you had some black players make it, uh, it, it was a much smaller number of African-Americans who were playing professional baseball and, and you no longer had the black managers and you no longer had the black coaches and you certainly didn't have the black owners. And, and it wasn't black restaurants that were selling to the concession stands. It was everything else was white. And so in some ways integration ended up hurting elements of the black economy, watching the slow pace of civil rights and also that civil rights didn't mean economic rights. Uh, you, you begin to see a rising tide of frustration uh, with integration. Not everybody thought this was the path forward uh, to achieve equality or, or even dignity for African Americans. Ideas of Black nationalism or organizing for collective Black empowerment had been living in Harlem for a long time. But after World War II, the, the main voice for, for Black nationalism, Black separatism, and um, finding strength within their own community uh, came from Harlem's number seven, Nation of Islam Mosque, and its leader, Malcolm X. So Islam in the United States, it doesn't begin with the Nation of Islam. Islam in the United States, and Muslims in the United States, uh, they probably began arriving in the 1600s um, with the importation of slaves from Africa, right? I mean, a lot of uh, these enslaved peoples brought with them uh, their Islamic traditions. However, you know, like Garveyism, um, the Nation of Islam, which uh, developed at a YMCA in the 1930s in the Midwest, um, it believes in Black empowerment and it believes in uh, creating structures that support African Americans outside of white society. And that's the key there, right? So it's not just about uplifting African Americans, but it's doing so in a way that is independent from the white power structures uh, that existed and always seemed to subordinate African Americans. It, it did lead to a lot of social programs in, in a way that uh, really changed lives and changed communities. Uh, they started schools and public health programs and, and black owned supermarkets. Uh, and they created this, you know, path to redemption for um, a lot of impoverished folks, a lot of people who had addiction issues, a lot of people who were in prison, including Malcolm X. He actually converts to the Nation of Islam while in prison. And they took the mantle of black nationalism that had sort of been held by Marcus Garvey and his followers, in, including Malcolm X's father and mother, who were both Garveyites, um, and, and they claimed it as their own. I'm not going to get too into um, too into the details of Malcolm X's life. There is an awesome biography by Manny Maribel, who um, I strongly recommend. Um, but again, like I said, his parents were Garveyites. He converted to the Nation of Islam while in prison. He became this very powerful speaker and, and thinker. Malcolm X's conclusion that um, African Americans needed to organize structures separate uh, of mainstream white society, uh, this brought him into conflict with mainstream civil rights leaders who were a lot more popular among white liberals uh, for espousing an integrationist 
vision, right? Malcolm X is saying we need to be separate so that uh, we could organize and control our own institutions. Uh, folks like Martin Luther King are saying uh, we need to be integrated into white institutions. Malcolm X is saying the problem with that is uh, if we're integrated into white institutions, as happened with the desegregation of schools, as happened with baseball, uh, we lose control over our own institutions because the white power structure is going to sweep them up. Uh, being integrated does not mean being equal. Uncle Martin is your friend, yet you would disagree with his uh, approach to what he wants to accomplish. Definitely. If his approach would bring about uh, what the black man in America needs to completely eliminate the problem that we have, I would say well and good. But I very much doubt that uh, anyone who uh, adopts the approach that Martin Luther King has been teaching to our people in that country can point to any meaningful gains that has actually served to solve the problem. We formed a group known as the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And the objective of, the, of that organization is to uh, bring about a condition that will guarantee respect and recognition of the 22 million black Americans as human beings. Now, Malcolm X is often accused of being violent in opposition to, to Martin Luther King's stance of nonviolence. Um, However, this is a little confused. Uh, he's not saying go and hurt people. Uh, he, he is saying that African-Americans have a right to defend themselves. Um, you would, if you go watch footage from um, what was happening in the South where police were just beating people up and they were literally not fighting back. Um, this is very different than the approach that uh, Malcolm X is advocating, particularly, uh, and you'll see him talk about here um, in response to the 1964 riots um, or, or black uprisings that, that took place in Harlem. Our people are still the victims of brutality and most of them are being brutalized by the police here in the North, or rather in the North, instead of in the South. It's surprising to me that uh, the explosion, the racial explosion, hasn't gotten farther out of hand than it actually has. And it's not a reflection of the ability of the New York police to contain the Negroes in, in Harlem. It's actually a reflection of the ability of the Negroes in Harlem to hold or exercise restraint in the face of the most severe uh, form of brutality. The uprisings that um, Malcolm is referring to took place after a, a police officer shot an African-American boy named uh, James Powell. 300 of the boy's classmates rallied after being informed of the news by the principal. And uh, a much larger uprising broke out in Harlem and also in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant. Uh, about 4,000 African-Americans participated. Uh, one protester ended up killed, 500 were injured, and nearly 500 were arrested. So the question is, and the question that we're still dealing with today, uh, what do you do? How do you create change? Um, Malcolm seeks to answer this. Uh, I don't in any way encourage black people to go out and initiate acts of aggression indiscriminately against whites. But I do believe that the black man in the United States and any human being anywhere is well within his right to do whatever is necessary by any means necessary to protect his life and property, especially in a, in a country where the federal government itself has proven that it is either uh, in, unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of those human beings. Malcolm would break from the Nation of Islam in, in the early 1960s, and uh, he begins to speak more, more largely about U.S. imperialism, and uh, he wants to, to use solidarity networks among Black folks all over the world and among Muslims all over the world uh, to improve their position globally because, you know, racism isn't just impacting African Americans, uh, it's impacting the way that we treat Black nations in Africa, he would argue, and, and in the Middle East. Before this was able to take off, uh, Malcolm X was murdered. And, and who murdered him remains somewhat a debate. There is new evidence that the NYPD seems to have been involved in, in his execution. Certainly the Nation of Islam, uh, the organization from which he broke, had some reason to, to want him dead as well. Um, the FBI was also following him. However, his death doesn't mean the end of his ideas. Uh, you can't kill an idea in the way that you can kill a man. His ideas are continued by leaders like Stokely Carmichael, who uh, was born in Trinidad, but moved to Harlem at the age of 11 and grew up in integrated New York City schools. Uh, he went to Bronx High School of Science. He became the head of SNCC before 
um, organizing with the Black Panther Party. This is the first time in the country that Negroes will be organized for their own political interest and they will form their own party and move along those interests as they see fit. It is unlike Negroes across the country who are registered in the Democratic Party but are not organized for their own interest. Now what I don't understand is this. You are also a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. At the same time, you are organizing a group in the South which almost certainly will tend to contribute to violence or at least counter violence. Well, they won't contribute to violence. They will just be seeking their political rights, and uh, they will have to defend those rights. Uh, now, they will defend it the way the country defends its own rights, the way we defended it in Vietnam, the way we defended it in World War II, the way we defended it in World War I, the way they we're going to defend it in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Carmichael ended up fleeing the United States for fear of his life. Uh, the FBI was killing a lot of black leaders. Uh, in, in the late 1960s, um, particularly people associated with the Black Panther Party. A and um, others were being murdered by white supremacists like Martin Luther King, who was killed in 1968. Malcolm X was killed in 1965. Medgar Evers was killed in 1963. Um, all over the country, not just in the US South, but all over the country, black leaders were, were being targeted by the US government for, for demanding economic justice, racial justice, not just integration, but real equity. Probably um, his flight saved his life, but his ideas would remain very powerful in the United States. And uh, the Black Panther Party would continue um, to, to speak in, in, in the same sort of messages uh, used by X and Carmichael. They had a pretty clear program for Black empowerment, as articulated here by um, one of their co-founders, Bobby Seale. When we first organized the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, he would say, Bobby, he says, we're going to draw up a basic platform. It's just a basic platform that the mothers who struggle hard to raise us, that the fathers who worked hard, that the young brothers in school who come out of school semi-literate. He would say, we want freedom, we want power to determine the destiny of our black community. Full employment for our people. Number three, want housing fit, decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. Number four, want all black men to be exempt from military service. We want decent education for our black people in our community that teaches us the true nature of this decadent racist society and to teach black people and our young black brothers and sisters their place in the society because if they don't know their place in society and in the world, they can't relate to anything else. We want an end to the robbery by the white racist businessman of black people and black people in their, in their community. Number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. We want all black men held in county, state, federal jails and prisons to be released because they have not had a fair trial because they've been tried by all white juries and that's just like being tried in Germany being a Jew. Black people, number nine, when brought to trial, will be tried by members of their peers. And a peer being one who comes from the same economic, social, religious, historical, and racial background. And number 10, he would say, let's just summarize it. We want housing, we want clothing, we want education, we want justice, and we want peace. When Huey says every black man put a shotgun in your home, and once we let the man know, say, look, we armed from block to block, and we're going to patrol you from our windows. And we're not going to have you brutalizing none of our people in the streets. Do you realize what kind of power black people have then? Because you begin to neutralize that police force, because them cops going to start riding shaky and scared. In fact, we're in a position then to demand that they withdraw from our community because they occupy our community just like a foreign troop occupies territory. Very important to understand. We hate cops beating black people over their heads and murdering them. That's what we hate. Uh-uh, we got to stop it, brother. Let's get together and unify. So this sort of black organizing, uh, this terrified the white power structure, and, and they tried to shut it down, and like I've already said. A lot of people were assassinated. A lot of black leaders were assassinated for, for trying to organize within the black community to, to try to 
realize the dream of black power. And, and some of them were organizing with uh, poor white communities. Um, Fred Hampton was called the black messiah by the FBI director Hoover, uh, who uh, was really worried that uh, he could sort of organize um, working class folks uh, across racial barriers um, to, to challenge the structures of government that, that empowered people like Hoover. Um, and, and he was assassinated. 99 shots uh, while he was sleeping were uh, shot into his bedroom. Um, the FBI claimed that it was a shootout. Um, there's no physical evidence to back that. He was assassinated by the FBI. And Ronald Reagan took on the Black Panthers in California. Uh, he was governor of California at the time. He targeted people like Angela Davis, who, who you can see here explaining uh, why she thinks she was targeted. And in my case, when I think about the fact that uh, Ronald Reagan was the governor of California, Richard Nixon was the president of the U.S., the whole apparatus of the state was set up against me. Um, they had all of their resources and the FBI, the police, and they really meant to send me to the death chamber in order to make a point. It really didn't matter who I was. or It was that I was a very uh, convenient figure to make a point that they would suppress any efforts at revolution and liberation. Harlem was no exception in terms of urban centers that uh, were organizing for black power um, during this period. And certainly there was a strong Panthers presence in Harlem. Uh, it probably started around 1966 in Harlem. One of their first acts was to demand better education opportunities uh, for black folks living in Harlem and to demand a community college uh, for the community as well. The Harlem branch, uh, they established breakfast programs like what is done elsewhere. They established a youth branch. They uh, established a screening center for sickle cell anemia. There was a health care clinic uh, that provided medical and um, dental services to the community at, at a much lower cost than they could find elsewhere. Um, so it was really about nurturing the community, taking care of the community, taking care of their own. There was a newsletter that went out to, to educate uh, the Black community in New York City. It was um, spread by the Black Panther Party, not just in Harlem, but the, Har the groups in Brooklyn and the Bronx and elsewhere. Um, and, and their basic demand was that they wanted community control and they wanted to sort of cultivate the political consciousness uh, of folks um, in the Black community in New York City and in Harlem particularly. Uh, the organization was infiltrated by cops. Uh, this was seen as a threat as elsewhere. Um, as we talked about, uh, overall, uh, during this period, 1969, 26 Black Panther Party members were killed, 760 were jailed, um, and they were systematically undermined by local and federal authorities. Uh, in New York, they brought up the leaders of the Black Panther Party on, on false charges, which were clearly fabricated, that they were going to bomb or shoot up department stores and or police stations. Uh, 21 Black Panther members were tried. It ended up being the longest trial in New York City's history because they kept searching for evidence that, that just wasn't there. Uh, celebrities took up the Panthers' cause. It became this major, major trial. Um, they were acquitted of 156 charges uh, because, um, again, this was just trumped up charges to try to persecute a community that was trying to demand its independence uh, from from white society and from white structures. Despite this, the damage was done. By the end of the trial, uh, the organization no longer existed in New York City. They took out the 21 best organizers and that had a dramatic effect. Um, however, this community changed the culture and, and set a path for later generations that we're seeing in some ways today. Um, it inspired other movements in New York City, including the Young Lords. It, it inspired the Colombian students' strike of 1968, the, the Stonewall uprisings uh, in the battle for gay liberation uh, that took off in New York City, or the 1968 battle in Ocean Hill-Brownsville, uh, where the African-American community rose up demanding community control over their own schools. The anti-war movement, uh, which is huge in New York City. Um, all of these things are coexisting and gaining inspiration from each other. Um, but in many ways, uh, the Black Panthers uh, was the foundation of what would be a very radical 1960s in the city.